Okay, I appreciate being involved and in giving a presentation uh, in the Small Farms Local Foods webinar. Um, I'm Ken Kolkebeck, Poultry Extension Specialist. As you see, University of Illinois Extension, I've been there for about 24 years. Um, primarily involved with the commercial poultry industry, the small flock industry, backyard flock industry, which has ballooned a little bit this past couple, two or three years. But what I'm going to be covering with you this evening is uh, basically nutrition and health aspects of keeping your small flock uh, pasture rear poultry healthy, um, well fed, so they can either grow for you to produce meat or even uh, produce eggs. And it's very important to for these couple of subjects to interlink with buildings and, and so forth. So we're going to cover nutrition and health for this topic. Okay, uh, this slide basically shows a true range poultry situation. Um, as you see there, the hens are uh, not confined. Uh, there's a pasture, off, there's a fence off to the left, um, but lush green uh, grass for them. And you see where they mainly locate uh, and congregate is the upper portion of that pasture, um, but they're but they're scattered about. Um, as long as the weather's good. There are no predators um, through the air, you know, hawks or owls or in the ground, on, the, uh, on the ground, you know, coyotes, um, dogs, etc. Uh, they're perfectly comfortable. And this is what we call range rearing of pasture, range rearing of poultry. Um, and it's a little bit different than, than pasture reared. And I'll show you a slide in regards to that uh, a little bit later. But uh, this is a true range rearing situation. And so it's important to look at nutrition and health in this aspect as well. Okay, so nutrition for pasture rear poultry. It'll differ a little bit from uh, birds that we keep in cages, birds that we keep in a, um, in a floor pen, um, because um, they do have other nutrients besides what they're given through the feed, uh, but it's very important. Okay, uh, what should be in the ration? Um, well, basically, it's going to depend on what species that you are raising, layers or broilers, and maybe even possibly turkeys. Um, so what should be in the ration, basically, as you see there, um, a poultry ration is based up uh, upon uh, corn, basically corn and soybean meal. Uh, the corn provides the energy and the calories, and the soybean meal mainly provides the protein. Okay, and so that's really important to get that mix um, correctly in the ration, even if you're pasture rearing where the birds do have access to some plant material. And uh, usually it's about 60% corn and about 20% soybean meal. And then, of course, vitamins and minerals uh, added to it as well. Okay, so other than the species, you need to be cognizant of the breed, uh, whether you're going to have a Cornish Rock uh, for meat birds, Rhode Island Red, White Lager for egg production. Uh, the ration and the energy and protein, vitamins and minerals are going to be different for each breed um, that is that you're wanting to raise. Okay, and so desired production level, I've listed there: fast versus slow growing, um, final weight egg production, exhibition, et cetera. Those are just some criteria. And uh, usually with our commercial type bird, our Cornish cross birds that are fast growing birds, they require a higher energy diet than maybe the slow growing bird. And then um, uh, Kyle had re uh, related that to, had talked about that in the Label Rouge uh, bird that is used in France uh, earlier. And that's a slow-growing bee, and so the diet is going to differ between that and uh, the fast-growing bees. Of course, you want as much weight as possible if you're producing meat birds. You don't want them too heavy or too fat, um, but, you're, but that's going to be a criteria that you need to basically document in your little uh, raising project of these type of birds. Of course, egg production, uh, the one we use mostly for commercially is the white layer and hen. Uh, produce the most eggs, but you can do that with a 
um, even a um, uh, Bar Plymouth Rock, uh, Rhode Island Red, which is a dual purpose breed. Um, but here again, the diet is going to make a difference in um, the criteria that you're looking for is either producing meat and or eggs. Okay, water is important. Um, that's why I stuck this slide in here. When you're talking about nutrition, we must not forget water. Water is basically a poultry carcass or a bird is about 60 to 70 percent water. We are as well. Um, and so water is very, very important. So clean water uh, all the time um, in combination with a good nutritional diet helps those birds to grow properly. And this is kind of what this slide was uh, put in there for. Okay, let's just run through a little basic information on nutrients, what the bird requires to grow properly, uh, what the bird requires to basically, uh, you know, lay properly. Um, nutrients need to be provided for maintenance. We need to keep the birds healthy and alive, of course, and uh, for growth production. Um, varies with the species, breed, age, and sex. You know, the males require a little bit different diet than the females do because they grow at different rates. Um, age of the bird uh, makes a difference to the breed and the species. Okay, when we talk about protein, what we're really talking about is the concentration of amino acids in the diet. That's what we mean by an appropriate protein level diet. And um, if the bird, you don't provide enough amino acids of the different amino acids that are essential and non-essential, you won't get a, have a diet that um, is basically have enough protein for the birds. So laying hens, we need a diet of about 16 to 17% protein. A broiler, we need basically 23 to 19% protein. Uh, let's talk a little briefly about laying hens, that's 16 to 17% protein. In extension, I get a lot of calls of people calling in, and um, they say that the birds are through in a molt. Uh, they're not producing well. Well, the first thing I ask them is about the diet. Do, do you have or providing a diet that has a significant amount of protein in it to provide for the protein that they need to lay uh, a lot of eggs um, properly. And um, so that's why we need a diet of 16 to 17% protein. And I'll get into a little bit, uh, a little bit later on uh, diluting the diet as well. So in a growing broiler, we usually start them out with a diet that has about 23% protein in it, uh, corn, soybean meal, vitamins and minerals. And as the broiler grows, that'd be the first week or so, and then as the broiler grows up to six, seven, eight weeks of age, we drop that protein down to about 19%. The level of energy in there probably increases slightly. Um, and then you come up with, you know, at six, seven weeks of age, you come up with a, uh, a broiler that's ready, ready to be slaughtered, ready, ready for market. Um, but that's the appropriate level. Because the birds are growing, they need a higher protein level than what a laying hen would, and that needs a lower protein level diet. Okay, so what provides, um, you know, uh, basically the, the nutrient provides, uh, besides protein, um, other things, carbohydrates, um, and which is energy, okay? And uh, like I said before, corn is the major source of energy, um, and it's about 60% in layer mash, also about 60% in a broader diet, maybe a little bit, bit more because we have a higher energy source. Uh, so corn is the major component uh, that provides needed carbohydrates uh, for growing birds. Okay, a poultry diet also has to provide adequate fat, which is an, a, a, another important source of energy. Okay, and this can be provided by animal fat, what we call animal fat, poultry fat, and grease, and different fat sources. Okay, and... Uh, you know, a source like corn oil can also be substitute for that as well. But so you need, besides carbohydrates, you need an adequate energy source, which is provided by fat in the ration. Okay, uh, so that's a couple of little uh, basic um, initial statements. Let's talk a little bit about vitamins. All right, um, 
fats, there are fat soluble vitamins and water soluble vitamins, just to break it down. And I've listed the fat soluble vitamins A, D3, E, and K, water soluble vitamins, riboflavin, biotin, and uh, there's a whole bunch more. So a combination of fat soluble and water soluble need to be provided in the diet. Um, and this is usually provided in the diet via a vitamin mix, which you will add to the corn and soybean meal base diet to provide those vitamin levels. And um, uh, so, so it's important to get that vitamin mix in there at the proper level um, to help bodily functions um, you know, of the birds as they're growing and laying eggs. Okay, so that's a little bit about uh, vitamins. Well, how about minerals? Okay, uh, we have different types. We can subdivide minerals into macro minerals and micro minerals. Don't want to make this too complicated, but we need to know basically the difference between the two. Okay, so in the particular poultry diet, you have calcium, phosphorus, and salt. Okay, calcium and phosphorus are very important for bone formation, for the growth, like a broiler's. And it's particularly important for laying hens and producing good, strong eggshells, since the egg is about 96% calcium carbonate. So we have to provide an extra source of calcium in the diet. Um, we have to also have to provide salt in the diet. Uh, well, how we provide calcium is through ground limestone or oyster shell is, um, is, is sometimes used. Typically, a small flock producer would add Calcium is a free, uh, free choice, in other words, basically a bowl of oyster shell uh, in with the birds, and so they can eat it as they need to, okay? Um, usually if you're producing or have laying hens that are producing eggs, you want about 3.5% to 3.75% calcium in the diet uh, for the good, strong eggshells. And this free choice oyster shell, um, or line, oyster shell mainly, which can also be uh, called grit, will provide that calcium source. Uh, so those are very important. And salt is also important. If you take salt out of the diet, birds are going to go through a molt pretty quickly. And so salt must be added to the diet, oh, about 0.03% um, if we were to get down to, you know, some specific numbers. All right, what about feed additives? Um, there are things like antioxidants, pellet binders, if you're going to produce a pellet, coccidiostats, antibiotics, okay? Um, so let's just go down to uh, talking about coccidiostats. Usually if you're raising uh, pastured poultry and if you're raising Cornish crosses, uh, you probably need to have a coccidiostat in the feed um, and or the water, okay? And so this is added in a minute amount um, and then it is added to the birds diet as they are growing. Um, and so what you need to do basically a week or two before you process the birds, you need to take coccidiostat out of the feed so there's not a residue in the meat uh, when you process the birds. Coban for one is a coccidiostat, Amprol in the water is another coccidiostat. Um, it's important to provide this so the birds don't get coccidiosis and we'll talk about that in the health session. Antibiotics, antibiotics are typically not added to a layer diet or a broiler diet. If you have a problem where you have, um, you know, a little bit of a disease problem or the birds are unhealthy, then you're going to have to add an antibiotic either through the feed or the water to help them get over the hump. It's just like um, when we get a cold, we need an antibiotic to help us get through it until our immune system can attack the virus. Okay, so that's a little bit about feed additives. Okay, it's really important to use the right feed. Um, for broilers, uh, a starter, a grower, a finisher. Basically three phases is what we call it. And it depends on the type of the bird and the age of the bird. Starter basically has uh, higher energy, protein. Um, the finisher uh, would be different. Okay, so use the right feed, and that's really, really important. Okay, a common... Um, question I get involves feeding what are called scratch grains. Scratch grains are cracked, rolled, whole grains like corn, 
barley, oats, and wheat, as, it, as you see there. And basically, you don't want to um, overfeed scratch grains. And so the rule of thumb is listed there that you must, if you wanted to feed a scratch feed to help cut down the, the cost of the diet, feed only as much as the chickens can consume in about 20 minutes. It's only 10 to 15 percent of the total daily feed consumption. Okay? And you can also supply grit to help digest the food. But remember, the gizzard in the chicken is basically the muscular stomach. It is responsible for grinding up the food. So grit is really not necessary, but people still like to feed it. Okay? So scratch grains, but you need to be careful. On feeding scratch grains, I get a lot of calls that people call in and say, okay, um, I'm feeding some scratch feed or I'm feeding them uh, whole corn, okay, uh, or cracked corn. Uh, they just absolutely love it. And sure, the birds will just absolutely devour that stuff if you let them, okay? But think about it a minute. If you feed them uh, more scratch feed than what they need, okay, they don't have enough capacity or the want to consume the regular feed that they should be eating. In other words, the prepared feed that has the appropriate protein, vitamins, minerals, and energy. So you can effectively dilute the feed if you feed a lot of scratch grains. And so you need to be really careful in regards to that. Uh, what will happen is uh, they just won't grow very well, uh, won't produce eggs very well, and then you're scratching your head and saying, why not? Because they absolutely love that stuff. Um, but why not is because they're not getting the appropriate percentages of the other things that they need. Okay. Uh, here's a little slide on, uh, you know, feeding um, a scratch system and a conventional mash system, 50% scratch grains and mash feed, um, you know, should be about 20% protein, okay? And the final mixture, you would use that to calculate the final mixture of your um, scratch grain in the mash feed, okay? So um, you need to kind of basically look at this as from not from a scientific aspect, but from a performance aspect. Um, feed them scratch feed, but not too much. Make sure that you get the appropriate protein. All right. So feeding mistakes. Uh, and here I say do not feed scratch feed to, or table scraps. So I'm kind of contradicting what I said earlier. However, if you look at it, um, you can feed scratch feed. You just don't feed them very much. Okay. Um, it's And you can also... This, you can still run into problems if you feed scratch feed or feed uh, a commercial diet with scratch feed. Um, I guess I'm not saying do not, but you need to make sure that you have an appropriate percentage, okay? And as I say there, the blending will reduce the level of nutrition, the bird will not grow well, and will decrease egg production, okay? Less resistant to disease. Uh, basically, they will eat the feathers of the other birds in your little flock, to offset the nutritional differences, uh, nutrient defic deficiencies. And so when birds start eating, pecking on feathers of other birds, um, what they're looking for is protein because feathers have about 17% protein, a good protein source. And so um, you see that, then, you're, you're, then you think, okay, I should not feed so much scratch feed. Maybe I ought to just do the completely commercially prepared feed uh, to feed those birds, and you'll be better off. Okay, so let's. Uh, so how about if you have them on a pasture situation? Chickens will obtain limited nutrients from forage plants. Um, you know, once they eat it all, basically they won't get any more. Okay, but they may eat, in, may eat enough nutrients to replace five to ten percent of the diet. Um, but it's best to assume that they get no nutrients uh, from pasture. Um, but that's not really true either because they probably do get a little bit, okay? Um, if you have them on pasture, you need to keep the forage uh, that they're exposed to young and vegetative. Um, you know, not, not old grasses, but uh, spring grasses, uh, they'll provide water. They'll provide uh, some nutrients as well, okay? So you need to probably ignore um, vegetation over about four inches high because basically it's lost its nutrient capabilities to give to those birds uh, when you have them on pasture and pasture reared poultry situation. Okay, oats, ladino clover, alfalfa, 
legumes, um, you know, appropriate um, you know, pasture type um, grasses um, can be used when you're pasturing poultry. Okay, cool season, summer season. All right, um, legumes may increase omega-3 fatty acids in meat and eggs, so that's that's probably good. Okay. Other besides the uh, nutrients that they get from the pasture, what about other concerns? Well, up here in the Midwest, we don't have a concern with fire ants, but down south, you do. Um, and uh, fire ants, base, basically small ants that congregate and can they can kill birds. So um, that is a concern with pasturing poultry, particularly in the southern part of the United States. Okay, some other past, past plants for poultry pastures. Um, even though the dandelion, you know, we consider it a weed, uh, birds will eat that. Yarrow, sage, and nasturtium, um, they will eat that too. So uh, basically what's out in the pasture, as long as it's, um, you know, basically young, fresh, uh, not overgrown, would be a good pasture source. Okay. So as we said, water is important for chicks. Water is important for growing birds as well. Okay, so... Um, it's immediate, you need it immediately for day-old broilers, okay? Um, they have, when they're hatched, they have enough food supply for three days, but you need water, okay? Uh, it's important to keep the waters clean, flushed out prior to the chicks coming or prior to when you buy them. Make sure you have fresh water for them. Drinker types, uh, you can have a simple system where you have open drinkers and troughs, bell-shaped drinkers, cups, etc. You need to be cognizant of the space um, per bird because they will, you know, maybe all try to drink at one time, particularly in hot weather. But in your pasture-reared system, you probably have enough space and really don't need to worry about that. Okay, a little picture of a um, nipple-type water system for poultry. And you probably would not have this in a pasture-reared system. You probably just have a water fount or a jug that would provide water for the birds. You clean it out daily and provide fresh water for them, okay? So that's a little bit of information about nutrition. Um, just to kind of summarize, um, you have to be careful about providing the birds adequate nutrition. Um, protein, energy, um, grit, um, basically what we've covered, you have to be careful about the appropriate percentages. You need to provide feed in front of them all the time. Um, and uh, need to make sure that it doesn't get wet, um, provided in a system where the birds can eat it properly. Um, if you have it in your pasture reared system, um, the le even the level or the height of the feeder is very important. Um, it should be at the level of the back for them to avoid wasting feed as they're eating, okay? And make sure that in your pasture system that you have uh, a cover over your feed. If, if it rains in on them, um, on the feed, you know, it's going to get wet, it's going to get moldy, and you're going to have problems, okay? So there's a lot of things to worry about and to think about with nutrition. Okay, let's uh, change subjects a little bit um, and talk about poultry diseases and pests. Again, another important area when raising pasture rear poultry. Uh, on the left, I've listed a whole bunch of things to um, look at as far as you need to learn the symptoms of a poultry disease. Generally, in a small flock situation, you don't have a very, you know, a, a lot of disease problems, although sometimes things can happen, okay? You need to know whether the birds are eating properly, okay, uh, whether they're consuming enough. In other words, they have, do they have an appetite? Uh, is there diarrhea? Is there coughing, lameness, depression? All these things here uh, that I've listed. Um, and this is courtesy of Dr. Clark, um, University of Arkansas. So you need to know what you're looking for, okay? So when you're first starting out, um, in your first flock, you may not know, uh, but you need to read up on it and realize um, that, you know, things can happen. Uh, birds do get diseases. They get sick. What do you do? Um, and so you need to know the symptoms of, some of the diseases that occur, okay? Unique problems in pasture poultry. Well, there you see it, uh, maybe not bears in this part of the, part of the world, um, uh, but certainly foxes, coyotes, um, 
etc. Predation, lack of environmental control. You see the hutch there with the cover. Uh, that's to keep the sun off and the wind and the rain. Okay, um, and pasture rear situation. And holy smokes, um, um, it'd be bad news for a tornado to come by and just you know pick up one of your houses and the chickens and uh, relocate them a couple miles away. And I'm sure that's happened um, in the past. Okay, so there are unique problems to worry about um, in a pasture rear poultry, poultry system. Okay, let's talk a little bit about motor transmission of a disease. Um, you know, there's a horizontal and vertical, bird-to-bird uh, -bird contact, equipment-to-bird, all right? Vertical, it basically goes from the hen to the chick through the egg. We call that pylorum, salmonella pylorum, salmonella typhoid, a couple diseases that is a vertically transmitted disease. Okay, you don't have to worry, worry about vertical if you buy your chicks from a, what we call an NPIP approved hatchery. Natural Pult um, National Poultry Improvement Plan, NPIP, and they will be salmonella plorum, salmonella typhoid free. And so you wouldn't have to worry about the vertical transmission of this disease going, getting through your chicks uh, from the hens that produces those eggs. Um, horizontally, you do, okay, in your small flock or pasture poultry situation, bird to bird contact, if they're all together, you don't have to worry about that. But equipment to bird, you might have to. And, of course, um, it's really important to, if you have neighbors that have pasture poultry, don't have your neighbor come over to your place and go look at your birds. It's not smart. And you should not go over and look at birds and your neighbor's property, okay? Um, so you have to worry about that transmission of diseases. Uh, I've got a few pictures of um, what's called AE, avian encephalomitis. It's a neural disease. Chicks will look like that. Their head will move back and forth. Um, typically, you probably would not see that. Uh, however, you might see foul cholera. A colleague here basically saw a turkey flock that had foul cholera one time. Just total devastation. You had to get antibiotic in the water really quickly. But the waddles swell up like that, and it's a respiratory disease. Okay? Foul pox, and this is what's called a dry pox. Um, and foul pox is basically transmitted by just mosquitoes from bird to bird. And so during the summertime, you know, that might be a problem. Um, it's called a dry pox. We typically vaccinate for foul pox at a pullet age, uh, but if you're raising, uh, you know, commercial broilers up to seven weeks of age, there's really no need to vaccinate. And with small numbers, no need to vaccinate as well. Newcastle disease, here again, it's a neural disease, uh, respiratory disease as well. That's a picture of bird affected with Newcastle disease. This is what you might see in your pastured poultry situation, particularly if you have your pastured poultry, your poultry on um, wetland. In other words, uh, it gets wet. Roundworms, okay? Roundworms, gapeworms, tapeworms, etc. cetera. Uh, this is a pretty bad, um, you know, infestation of roundworms, okay, and then you have to probably put a dewormer in the water. Piperzine, for example, is a standard one to use, okay, for roundworms. And so you need to make sure if your birds do lose weight, um, you might suspect roundworms. Look at the fecal material really closely, and you might, uh, you know, then suspect they have roundworms. If you see worms in there, then you got to put a dewormer in the water. Okay, <clears throat> so you've got uh, coccidia, we've talked about coccidiosis. You've got tapeworms, roundworms, blackhead, which affects turkeys. Chickens can be a carrier, but turkeys can basically die from blackhead disease. Um, there's hairworms, um, and so tracheal worms as well. These are things that you need to be aware of. Not necessarily that you will have them in a pasture poultry situation, but you need to be aware of and know how to basically um, treat and correct this problem. With any diagnosis, you need to be basically, just like what I said, have a diagnosis, okay? You need to, um, you know, call a veterinarian and say, okay, I've got a problem with birds. I think they have roundworms. What should I do? 
Well, they'll probably uh, want a, uh, want a fresh dead, and uh, you you probably need to get them one. You'll need to then uh, you know treat them with some sort of medication. Okay, a lot of things on this slide, um, but these are the things that um, uh, can can occur in a uh, you know a pasture poultry situation um, with problems with dogs, mink, weasels, raccoon. Okay. Um, and this is the, uh, on the left is basically the reason, and on the right is the predator um, that did that, okay? So you can match those up and, um, you know, basically decide, okay, do I have a mink problem? Do we have a raccoon problem? Do I need to set traps? Um, and so I get a lot of calls and, you know, Birds died, what do I do? Okay, what happened? Um, how'd they die? You expect you have a raccoon problem, you need to get out there and get the raccoons. And so um, you need to make sure that you, uh, um, you know, note, uh, note what happens and who, who does it. Okay. Um, avian influenza, I wouldn't worry about that too much, or bird flu is what we call it. Uh, so don't worry about it too much. Uh, it's a virus. Infected birds shed the virus through the saliva, nasal secretions, and feces. Um, here again, it's something that you're probably not going to have to worry about in a pastured poultry situation. Okay, avian flu, just a slide on how it's transmitted. Um, so here again, um, through the manure, respiration, um, you know, uh, basically truck trucks, um, now, I will tell you that ducks and geese is a reservoir for the virus. So if you have your pasture poultry uh, in a pond nearby and you have some ducks and geese that come down a lot of that pond, I would move your shelter. Um, you want to try to get that away from any flyways or areas where uh, ducks and geese will, will come down because they can harbor that virus and then uh, give it to the birds. So um, it's important for uh, to note that. Okay, the big thing is biosecurity, okay? You need to make sure your birds are isolated. You need to make sure that you recognize traffic control. Don't have your neighbors come over, okay? Um, you need to make sure that your area is clean. Clean and disinfecting houses, people, materials, and equipment, okay? So this is what we call just general biosecurity. Common sense and how to keep things clean. Picture of a an individual uh, coveralls, hat, and boots probably overkill for you know raising pasture poultry. But hey, um, you know you 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 probably should work with your birds and have some sort of rubber boots when you're out there working that you can clean off every time you go out there and every time you leave there. Clean it off with a disinfectant and put those boots in some area that basically um, is pretty biosecure um, and is uh, clean. Sanitation, um, you should pay daily attention to dead birds, what to do with them. Uh, you, should, you should call your county advisor and ask, you know, can they be buried? Um, you know, how do you dispose of them? Can you throw them in the trash? Well, probably not. So can you incinerate them? You need to make sure that each county probably has the <coughs> ordinances on that. Uh, make sure you don't have any spilled feed, manure, and litter. Um, you know, make sure that you basically dispose or move the your uh, pasture pole, your little system around um, if you can, um, and make sure that you just keep the area clean. So that's basically sanitation. Choosing a disinfectant, well, a lot of things listed there, but basically a, a good disinfectant for a little poultry uh, facility or even uh, in pasture reared is to clean your equipment with Iodine and water mixture solution. Usually I tell people about a 10% iodine solution will do a really great job. Make sure you wash it off uh, with water first, spray that on, and then uh, clean, it, clean it off with just regular water. Um, so that, that would be an inexpensive type of disinfectant. You don't have to go uh, crazy and buy a buy, uh, you know, commercially prepared disinfectant, but iodine and water and a five-gallon sprayer does the job. Okay, here's some commercially um, prepared um, disinfectant. Also, bleach, three parts of bleach and two parts of water. Pretty inexpensive. 
And it's, it would be a good disinfectant to clean your equipment, clean your feeders, etc. Okay. We'll talk just briefly here on foul mites, um, and that can be a problem in a pasture poultry situation. The northern foul mite um, is popular, and chicken mites are popular uh, given uh, different environmental conditions. Okay, uh, the transmission is bird to bird treatment miticides. You must um, seven dust is the appropriate treatment probably for foul mites. You can either dust the uh, the back of the bird and or you might need to spray them. One time we had a problem here at the research farm with mites. Uh, we couldn't get rid of it. We had to actually dunk the birds into a miticide barrel up to the neck, okay? And then we got the mites off the birds. Um, but the what you can really use is probably seven dust, follow the labels for foul mites. Poulter lice, same thing. Seven dust would probably look great. They're little small white bugs. Um, they, and if you pick up a bird and they get on you, don't worry, they'll jump off because you're not the right body temperature, and they'll jump off. So the poultry lice can be a problem. Other mites, northern fowl mites, scaly leg mite, red mite, louse, you know, those can be a problem, but you need to be able to recognize that in your pastured poultry small flock situation. Talk a little bit briefly about buffalo gnats. We got calls about four years ago about buffalo gnats. They're a small black fly, and uh, people would call and say, I lost 12 birds last night. And I said, well, what was going on? Well, uh, didn't think it was a, you know, dogs or coyotes or whatever, um, and they there was some, some flies around. So buffalo gnats have been a problem. They like um, running water, um, usually in May, April, May when the calls come up and come in. And the way to do that is try to keep your birds inside. However, if you're just starting a pasture poultry project, that's not possible. So just watch out for those. There are some sprays you can use. Um, and uh, But hopefully um, you're in an area where you will not have this problem. Rodent control, well, wherever there's poultry feed and water, there's going to be mice and rats and rodents. Um, that can carry diseases and so and cause problems. Uh, make sure you maybe have bait stations outside your pasture poultry place or your little pen, okay, to keep the mice out of there uh, as good rodent control. Natural remedies, well, nothing substitutes for a good biosecurity plan. Keep good records, okay? Monitor the flock health daily. Reaction plan in the case of a health problem. Know who to call. Okay. Um, external parasites. There are some uh, some products that are um, uh, basically natural. Um, garlic. Some say garlic works on northern fowl mites. Scaly leg mites soak the feed in potassium permanganate. Um, diatomaceous earth uh, might work as well. Okay. Um, Garlic, again, on intestinal worms, pumpkin seeds. <laughs> uh, there's all different types that people have recommended, okay? And so that can substitute. If it works, fine. Use it. If it doesn't work, well, go to a commercially um, commercially prepared product. Okay. The last four or five slides are really important to maintaining health. Keep your distance. Keep your neighbor's distance. Um, don't go back and forth and visit uh someone's uh, pasture poultry, and then, uh, you know, go back to yours and immediately step into the pen without cleaning your boots off, okay? Keep your distance. Keep the equipment clean. Use an iodine solution, okay? Um, that's really important. Haul diseases home. Well, this probably won't be a problem, but, um, you know, you can, uh, you know, with your tractor or equipment, um, it's important to do, make sure that they're clean if they're around, uh Anywhere near the birds that that can um, you know um, get get material from that from the um, tires to the to the birds, make sure you don't haul it home or haul it somewhere else. Don't borrow your knees disease from your neighbor. Okay, in other words, don't trade birds back and forth. All right, that's probably the worst situation. A lot of calls come in and say, okay, I've gotten uh, some birds from a swap meet. Well, that's fine and dandy if they're all healthy, but if they're not healthy. Um, then you're going to have problems. 
and that's what usually happens. So don't borrow disease from your neighbor. Know the warning signs of infectious bird diseases. Okay, know when a bird's sick, how to treat it, who to call. Okay, so this is really important to in maintaining a healthy uh, flock. Okay, and if you have questions, um, you can call your local extension agent. Your local extension agent will probably call me, um, and I might refer you to uh, you know our, our U of I diagnostic lab. Okay, uh, in order to post birds to find out really what the problem is. Um, but I'm going to ask you things like, um, are you feeding the birds properly? Are you providing enough nutrition? Um, and what about the the surroundings of the equipment? Is the equipment clean? Okay. And so those are the things that I'm going to ask um, uh, if you call in and and ask, uh, you know, basically, um, you know, what's the problem uh, with my birds? But all in all, it's it's pretty satisfying to raise pasture poultry. Um, it can be done without any problems, except you have to know how the birds react and know what they need. So uh, I'll con con conclude this session and uh, pre appreciate uh, your attention.